What's going on, everybody? My name is Dan Orlovsky. I'm going to be joined by a friend of mine, Dave Phelps. We're here to talk to you guys about the free agent quarterback market. What's going on behind some of the moves that have happened? What's, you know, talk about some stuff before free agency gets started here in a couple weeks. And uh, talk about some plays that, you know, in my opinion, a lot of people's opinions, opinion, Kirk Cousins, I'll drop some plays, talk about some of the plays that, that he's made throughout this season and why he's hands down the best free agent quarterback available right now. So, Dave, what's going on? I'm excited that you're joining me for this, man. Here I am, man. Here I am. There's no offseason in the NFL, right? Absolutely not. Certainly not nowadays. So let's get started with some stuff. I'll let you kind of take it from there and we'll go, man. Yeah, so first let's let's jump off uh, with a couple just latest news updates from the NFL. I think the first one, kind of surprising, Marcus Peters moving out to one of your old stomping grounds, uh, following up on Josh Norman a year or so ago. Talk to us about corners in general. Is it is there a point where they become too boisterous, too loud? You know, do they take the locker room over, or is this a case of they got a corner back from the from the skins and the Alex Smith trade? Maybe it just makes sense to go in a different direction. Where's your head? Yeah, I mean, lockdown corners are not all that different than franchise quarterbacks. There's just not a lot of humans on the planet like them. And so a guy like Josh Norman, a guy like Marcus Peters, it's really team dependent. If you, from the organization down, top down, your head coach, everybody can handle personalities. And as long as your personalities aren't, extravagantly out of, out of line where it's going to hurt your team. You don't want somebody on your team who's going to hurt your organization. And it seemed like the chiefs felt that way about Marcus Peters. But if you're an organization that can handle personalities and, and you see talent in a guy, there's just not a lot of people around that have those unique skill sets that are able. Marcus Peters is one of those guys that you can line up on the field and just say, Hey, you take that guy for the whole game, you know? And, and so He's a really unique player. I think there'll always be places in the NFL for guys like that because the, the, the sample size or the pool that you get to choose from for people like that isn't very big. And, I mean, looking a little into Marcus Peters, there is a little bang or bust with him, though, right? He makes a ton of plays, strips, interceptions, but there's a, he does have big play potential. Is that something co some coaches don't have a stomach for? Yeah, some coaches, you know, like uh, – there's just some coaches who will not accept one, his mannerisms off the field or his play on the field. Some coaches are just, I just want consistency. I just want consistency. Give me right. That's, going that's what I'm always thinking. Always do their job. And some coaches go, this guy's worth, and some of general managers go, this guy's worth taking a flyer on a little bit because for every one play he does mess up, he's going to make up by, for it by three or four really special plays. You know, he's not all that different than a young Asante Samuels. Asante Samuel early on, you know, had some mistakes, was guessy, would get beat deep. Not all that different than a Janoris Jenkins. Janoris Jenkins goes to the Giants and it becomes this really, really locked down, consistent corner. And I just think sometimes wake up calls for those guys are important. Marcus Peters got traded. He realized, okay, I'm not that important. So will that change a little bit of that, that downside to his game, that gets to his game? and make him more consistent because his, his, his ability, if it becomes consistent, is as good as any corners in the NFL. The Jenkins piece is interesting, though, right? Because when the Giants started to struggle a little bit this year, the other part of Jenkins started coming back. And so I guess it's something you're always going to have to juggle with these guys. But I think maybe even bigger picture – the Chiefs are just looking for some new faces in the locker room. It's kind of the vibe you get. Yeah, don't forget, they switched their general manager kind of right around the summertime last year. So this is his first offseason of really getting to put his fingerprint, his blueprint all over that team and the culture that he's trying to create and, and making it a, sending a very clear message to his team. Listen, no matter how good you are, we're not accepting some kinds of behaviors. And the vice versa is Les Snead in, in L.A. is going – you know, I feel like I've got a really good football team and I'm yep. or two away. Maybe I'm a corner away in Wade Phillips's defense who loves to play man-to-man -man defense. Am I a corner away from going from a top 16 defense to a top seven, top six? And so those are the, you know, as a general manager, you got to make decisions. And I think that's just something we're seeing one general manager make it one way and one make it a different way. And just a reminder to the fans that are uh, that are dialed in here. 
Uh, you can click the fan line in the upper right corner, and you can ask Dan a question face to face. Uh, he's got some pretty solid knowledge of the NFL, so you can you can kind of go all over the map with it if you want. But that you should see a fan line in the upper right corner of your screen. All right, Dan, let's get more into your wheelhouse here. Uh, you and I have talked a lot about my boy Captain Kirk. Yeah. It seems like uh, it seems like he's. I mean, we know he's on the move. There's a bunch of teams that are have been rumored. I think some are, you know, more smokescreen than anything else. But did the if we if we pretend he's going to the Vikings, yep. did they make a mistake not franchising Keenum or hanging on to Bridgewater? Yeah, you know, I said about Case Keenum this. I I think the answer is no. I think the answer is no. They didn't make a mistake in tagging Keenum with this. As good of a season as Case Keenum had, he also had the easiest quarterback job in the NFL last year. And that's not a knock on him. He played really well. But here's the thing. As a quarterback, when you have guys that you can throw to, which they had, the, the I think, the number one ranked combo of receivers with Thielen and Diggs in the NFL. And then you've got a tight end who you could throw to who's really good. And then you've got a running game who's pretty darn good. And then you've got a defense that goes, listen, just score 10 points and we'll handle the rest. As a quarterback, your job's pretty easy. And so this was the easiest he's ever had it on himself to play quarterback. And, so, and, and the season showed that, and that's not a knock on him. Kudos to him for doing that. But if you have the opportunity to go get a guy like Kirk Cousins, who, in my opinion, is a top 10 guy in the NFL, his play proves it, the stats prove it. If you have the opportunity in the cap space to go do that with a team like Minnesota that goes – all right, we've got guys that you can throw to. We've got a defense that you don't have to go be Superman with. If you can do it cap space wise, you don't even blink. You 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 make that you do whatever the moves that are necessary to make that happen. You go make happen. I think that's what's happened to Keenum is he's the he's the part of the variable that goes, OK, we want Kirk Cousins. What do we have to do? OK, we're not franchising franchise tag in case Keenum. OK, and what we can hop back to Cousins in a second, but. Something I've something I've wondered, and it seems like Robbie from Vermont has a similar question. I want to talk a little bit about Teddy Bridgewater, but let's let's bring in Robbie first for a, for a question. Yeah, I love it. Just got to figure out how to do it. Hey, how's it going, guys? Robbie, what's up? Hey, Robbie, you got Dave and Dan here. You're gonna ask uh, Dan a question about Teddy Bridgewater, I think, right? Yes, sir. So throw it at him. Where does Teddy Bridgewater go from here, especially if they are going to be going after Kirk Cousins so heavily, and if they don't, if they go away from Teddy Bridgewater? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting situation. I wouldn't be all that surprised. So you have to let Bridgewater go test the market if you're the Minnesota Vikings. And if you're Teddy Bridgewater, you should want to go test the market. So both those, I'm sure they've had conversations, and both those, both those parties are seeing it the same way. If, if you're Minnesota and you let's say you get Kirk Cousins, right? You still have to have a plan as a backup. And they might like Kyle Slaughter as their third stringer. But what happens if Teddy Bridgewater goes and tests the market and he's not really getting anything more than a two-year deal and $2 million a year? You might be able to bring Teddy Bridgewater back and continue that process for him. Now, unlikely... But let's say they take her cousins and move on. There will be a market for Teddy Bridgewater. I would imagine that be, there will be a, a market for him because he's only four years removed from being a first-round pick. He was highly thought of coming into the draft. And in the NFL, you always, always, always want quarterbacks. I wouldn't be surprised if he can go down and, and sign a, you know, kind of like a, a higher-end backup deal, fringe starter deal somewhere. You know, what comes to mind? Seattle. Seattle needs a backup quarterback. And if, if you like Russell Wilson's game as their coordinator with a Brian Schottenheimer coming in, you might be able to get Teddy Bridgewater in the tree. Now, cheap. And it might not be what Bridgewater wants, but he's in, you know, kind of the – it's just as much as we see players kind of remake their careers when they mess up off the field. He's kind of got to remake his career on the field. No one's seen him play in a year. He had this horrific knee injury. He's got to go out and prove I'm the player that I kind of was ascending towards. He's also not going to get big starter money in free agency. He's, only, he's had one season of 14 touchdowns. That's his best season ever. No one's going to go overpay for that in a market where they've got some free agents 
and some draft guys that they like. So, you know, I, I would imagine him getting a decent backup deal somewhere and reinventing himself, reproving himself in the NFL. Yeah, what do you – now, just thinking about that, what do you think about him maybe possibly landing at the Jets where they have nothing? And yeah, you know, drafting a quarterback. I get that, but you're if you're the Jets, you're certainly not going in saying, hey, we're going to sign Teddy Bridgewater, and then you know what, we'll draft somebody <clears throat> overall. Because, again, you've got to get proven on the field by Teddy Bridgewater is healthy. And if you're the Jets, do you really think more highly, right now, more highly of Teddy Bridgewater than you do of Josh McCown? Because if your plan is to go draft a kid early, you want Josh McCown in that room, not Teddy Bridgewater. You want a guy who completely understands every aspect about the NFL and that organization and that media market. How much information and knowledge and wisdom can he share with that young quarterback? And so, you know, Dan, what if he what if he talks same city, different team? Could he follow his OC to the Giants? Yeah, again, I would leave think, Eli there for a year and see what happens. Yeah, what do they think of Davis Webb? You know, is Davis Webb truly ready to be a quarterback? Do they not draft a rookie early on? Do they not take a Josh Rosen with the second pick? But he'll have a market. Do, you know, there. I think it's going to be a backup market, and I think it's going to be a healthy backup market for him. But as a general manager, there is no way that you can go invest a ton of money in him when you have not seen him. You won't have again. You will not have seen Teddy Bridgewater play football, real football, in two years almost. Because even the snaps he got last year wasn't a pressure situation. And again, he's a first-round pick. His best season's 14 touchdown passes. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Robbie. Good question, man. And just finishing up, Dan, on, on Bridgewater, there's going to be so many places for him, right? He's a, he's a good locker room guy. I mean, Miami comes to the top of mind, just going home back, you know, getting into that spot where he could see time if, if things don't go correctly uh, at the top with Tannehill. So I think Bridgewater is going to be all right. Well, this Everybody thing that you'll see is these general managers do so much homework. Even if you're a team that's not going to take a quarterback in the first or second round, you do your homework every year on all those prospects for unique situations like this, because there might be a team that had him rated as a first rounder and mm -hmm. left some of the stuff he's done. And then now is an opportunity where you can go accrue and get that asset or get that commodity on the cheap. Because again, his market's not going to be outstanding value wise. You might take all the, that information you had in the past and take advantage of it. Yeah. All right. So let's jump back to cousins. Um, you're a, you're a Twitter celebrity now with because of your whiteboard and your, your video work. So you want to take us through through something that stands out with you on tape for for cousins? Yeah, I'll get on I'll get on this board real quick, you know, and and draw some stuff up real fast for some people to get a, a unique understanding, you know, almost in a quarterback room of what you know some of the skill set that this guy has that I like. So I posted a couple Twitter you know plays on this on Twitter about this guy, but I'll draw this play up real quick. So they were in a three by one set. This is a play that they ran against the Eagles, and they got up, and I'm going to draw a defense for everybody so they can get a unique understanding of, you know, really what I like about this guy. So Philadelphia lined up in this defensive set. If everyone can see that, you can see the whole board. Okay. And they had a corner out here. They had a safety here. There's safety down here. A nickel and corner. So as a quarterback, there's not a lot that goes on when you're looking at this and going, all right, that's anything but maybe a cover three or man-to-man -man single high defense. So then they had an end, tackle, tackle, end, linebacker, and linebacker. Again, there's nothing about this defense that makes it interesting to me. I'm, I'm thinking, all right, I've got a really basic defense as a quarterback. I'm not thinking any kinds of pressures and whatnot. Well, their back was offset here. Here was, here's his cousins, and the back was offset. And at some point, this linebacker, these two guys moved. This backer went and shifted over weak, and this guy got to the line of scrimmage. Again, there's nothing about this as a guy who's studied offenses and defenses that says something's happening here. But, at but what does that mean? They shifted for a reason, right? So what, right. what does it mean? But this linebacker can blitz by himself, and they can still play man-to-man. -man. Everybody can okay. play man-to-man -man defense with a single high safety. Usually when teams are going to play cover zero, which means every guy, it's, it's, it's recess again. You got that guy. And they're going to blitz everybody else. That's cover zero, all-out blitz. Usually you'll get a tell 
by the safeties. If both guys are on one side of the ball, if the backers are in unique positions at the line of scrimmage, we call it a picket fence. If everybody on the defense is six, seven, eight yards, those are some of those tells. Well, on this play that I posted, there was no tell that he was getting cover zero, but somehow through his preparations, cousin preparation, cousin saw it. And Philadelphia ends up all out blitzing and they blitz everybody, this guy, and this guy drops down to cover the tight end. Cousins checks the play at the line of scrimmage and he throws this little out route to Crowder. Now, two things about that. Out routes against cover zero are the best. Out breaking routes because the DB is taught always maintain inside leverage. Always, always, always. Because if you get crossed up, if your face gets crossed, there's no safety. There's no one to save the play anymore, if that makes sense. And so I love that he got to an outbreaking route because it's easier. The second thing is this. So many quarterbacks can go and be in meeting rooms and be, be, pro, bowl, be pro bowlers in meeting rooms. They're meeting room pro bowlers. But to be able to take that knowledge from the meeting room and from your preparation in the week, trust me, I was one of those guys. I was phenomenal in the meeting room. And then I would get onto the field and – Sometimes I wouldn't trust my stuff. And I've been around so many quarterbacks like that. We've heard about you in the meeting room. For so many people, for, for him, for be able to take that preparation from the meeting room and from his week, realize that they were going to bring out their all-out blitz without lots of tells and get to that play, to be able to function at the line of scrimmage like that is not normal. There, now, there's guys who can do it in the NFL – and those are the guys who get paid a bunch of money. And that's a reason why I think he deserves that contract and he's worthy of it. Okay. Because he can so I think he takes the meeting room and preparation and applies it to the field. All right. Thanks for drawing that up for us. Uh, we have Andrew in Boston with a new question uh, when, whenever you're ready over there. Andrew, what's up, bud? Hey, Dan, how are you? Andrew, what's going on, man? What's going on? So this may be putting you in an uncomfortable spot, but I'm a big Matthew Stafford fan. He's he to me is that one of the guy. what was that? That makes two of you guys yeah, in this I chat. Love him. He's one of the, in my opinion, elite quarterbacks who hits a wall and just organizationally can't take it to the next level. If he were a free agent tomorrow, then you guys can dump me while you answer this. If he were a free agent tomorrow, where do you stack him up with both cousins, obviously head to head? in that class at Bridgewater or really it really anyone else who might come out of free agency at this point. All right. And so that's a great question. Let me say this. I think Kirk cousins is really, really good. He's not even in the same conversation as Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford has, you know, I always say quarterbacks, if you want franchise quarterbacks, really, really good, great quarterbacks, they need to check off all these boxes. Are they smart? Are they tough? Are they mentally tough? Do they have the ability to make every single throw? Can they lead? Do they have a work ethic? Can they study? Do they know how to prepare? Can they handle the media? I mean, there's just endless boxes. Matthew Stafford checks every single one. Kirk Cousins doesn't. And that's not a knock on Kirk Cousins. It's more of a, an admiration for Matthew. I spent three years with them. I understand each and every aspect of him and how it works. He would be the crown jewel maybe of the free agent class ever i mean ever the free agent class and he would be the most highly sought after sought after quarterback in the history of the nfl when it comes to free agency so he would stack up glowingly against them okay we, we kind of knew where that where that answer was going but in this case i think we all agree uh so we're going to spend the rest of the time on our favorite subject playing a kind of musical chairs with, with some of the vacancies and some of the available quarterbacks. Um, actually, hold on. We got one more <laughs> cousins, very popular subject. Uh, Bill uh, commented in uh, cousins only makes sense if he goes to a contender now. So is that Vikings or Broncos? Well, cousins only makes sense if he make, you know, you, you, of course you want a contender. You don't want him to go to a bottom feeder. I think he makes the most sense to Minnesota. And we can get into this. I'm sure you're going to a little bit, Dave. This is why I get weary of places like Denver or the Jets for him. I know the Jets have the tie because the offense with Jeremy Bates. But Cousins is leaving a place in Washington riddled with dysfunction. And that's the number one reason. Money is not the number one reason he didn't sign a contract there. It was the dysfunction of the organization. 
And so do you know, he does not want to go to a, an organization that is like this. And my thing with the Jets is with Bulls, what happens if they start one and two or one and three? Are they going to fire him? And it's the same with Vance Joseph in Denver. As much as I think Gary Kubiak being in the building in Denver helps them attract Kirk Cousins because he's a quarterback genius. What happens if they start one and two or one and three? Are they going to fire yeah. Vance Joseph and Cousins is back in the same spot he just left? And that's why Minnesota, they've got organizational structure. That head coach and general manager are going nowhere. It's a no-brainer for him to yeah. run on a dead sprint to Minnesota. And, and the truth is, it's it's not fair to count somebody else's money, but Cousins has made almost forty-four million in the last two years. Uh, granted, he wasn't you know making huge money before that, but the money plays tough if you if you read a lot of stuff about him. He seems like he's focused on other things now. Don't forget this: when he signed that franchise tender two years ago, he did an interview and said, you know, he signed it like within minutes of being tagged. He did an interview and said, "I'm going to make more money this year than I ever thought I would make." Right. Does that sound like a yeah. money driven? You know. No, and and truly, if you read up on him, he doesn't seem money driven. Easy for me to say without ever having met him. But anyways, so we've we've handled a few questions. The our favorite part is we're gonna I said like I said play musical chairs. I'm gonna say a team and what I think they're gonna do. You shoot me down or go with it. I love it. Jets, you you kind of tease this. We're on the, uh, we're pretty close to the same page. My opinion, another year in McCown, maybe two with this with an opt out or with with a way to get out of the second year, and you draft a quarterback. Where's your head? I completely agree. I mean, they don't have one. They don't have a quarterback coach. They have not hired a quarterback coach, so they have a new offensive coordinator. Sign Josh McCown, bring him back because he's the greatest asset in your building for a young quarterback. No offense to Jeremy Bates, he is the number one asset for your quarterback. And then draft somebody early on. Do your diligence. Find the scouts that you trust at that position and take somebody at the sixth pick. And to be honest with you, if you fall in love with one of them, don't wait till it. Don't wait till the sixth pick because make a move. Takes, find your guy. Okay. And and I don't know, you know, if you really look at how well the Jets played with McCown prior to his injury, they were I'm not, they weren't going to the playoffs, but they were not a laughing stock of a team. McCown played quite well this year. Oh man, dude, the first like six or seven weeks, I had said he was like a sleeper dark horse for the MVP. I mean, he was yeah, he played great. Top he played great in all the passing categories. So you've got to feel good about him. Now, I don't think Baker Mayfield should go there. I don't think it's Baker Mayfield because that market will rip your face off with any little thing that you do. I mean, he couldn't handle Northwest Arkansas on a Saturday night, so I'm not sure. Uh... I like him as a player, so and, I, and McCown would be great for him. I just don't think he's the fit there. All right, so that was so we agree on that one. Browns to me is Sam Darnold and a veteran from somewhere. Yeah, I'm running to go get Sam Darnold. I love, okay. love, love his game, and I I think really highly of Rosen, but I love Darnold's game. One, he fits Todd Haley's scheme. Two, the Browns need to get this decision right. Now, the thing is, they've got to surround him with people, but their quarterback coach really needs to refine. You know, with Darnold, I've said everything about him is magical sloppiness, even the good and the bad. And so they need to refine that sloppiness. And that might be a place where you go and get a Teddy Bridgewater on the cheap or a Sam Bradford for cheap and have that, that veteran there that can help you. 